Welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming. I'm Dr. Rajshree Nambudripad. My practice is OC Integrative Medicine in Fullerton. I'm board certified in internal medicine and I'm also a member of the medical staff at St. Jude Medical Center. So today I'm very honored and excited to be speaking on a very important topic all about mood and brain health and how to overcome depression and anxiety. So I wanted to speak on this topic because this is something that many of us suffer from. Uh, in fact, about 20% of adults suffer from depression or anxiety. And we're even seeing it in children and adolescents. So um, today I'm gonna delve into some of the root causes of mood symptoms and talk about ways that we can correct those underlying imbalances. So here's an overview of my talk. So I'll start by talking about the root causes of anxiety and depression. I'm gonna introduce you to some of the main brain neurotransmitters I'm gonna talk about how we can balance our neurotransmitters without medications. How can we optimize nutrition to help our mood? How does hormones affect our mood? What diet is ideal for optimal mood? And what are natural ways to boost our mood? So this is a picture showing uh, neurons, which are brain cells, and there's 100 billion neurons in the human brain. Neurons talk to each other through connections called synapses. And the way that one neuron talks to its neighbor is by releasing neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are chemicals that send messages from one neuron to the next. So when there's an imbalance in these neurotransmitters, that's when a patient will have symptoms, whether it's anxiety, depression, ADHD, which is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or OCD, which is obsessive compulsive disorder. So these are the main neurotransmitters that I wanted to introduce today. So you've probably all heard of serotonin. Serotonin makes you happy. So um, most of the medi prescription medications for depression are in a category of drugs called SSRIs, or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So these drugs are designed to give your brain that there's an impression of more serotonin. Dopamine is the other happy neurotransmitter. It makes you feel good, and it's the reward neurotransmitter. Um, if something is making your dopamine go up, you're gonna wanna keep doing that. So dopamine plays a role in a lot of addictive behaviors. Norepinephrine is very important for focus. GABA is the calming neurotransmitter. Glutamate is excitatory in the brain. And what's interesting is a lot of chemicals in our food, for example, MSG or monosodium glutamate, will bind to the glutamate receptors in our brain. And it has that excitatory effect and can affect your behavior. So a lot of people are really sensitive to MSG in the diet. And then acetylcholine is very important for memory. So we see that in Alzheimer's disease, there's actually a deficiency of acetylcholine in the brain. So is depression a Prozac deficiency? So Prozac and other antidepressants are some of the most heavily prescribed medications in the country. And medications are definitely life-saving tools and can help patients when they're prescribed in the right situations. The problem is sometimes they're prescribed a little too quickly. You know, the other downside is medications, have si they mask symptoms. And they, they're not always 100% effective and they carry side effects. So a lot of times on antidepressants, people will gain weight, they'll have digestive d distress, um, they'll have lower libido, and in certain instances, it can even raise the rate of suicide. So often there's a lot of root causes that can be addressed, and that's what I'm gonna focus my talk on today. So do we really need medications to keep us from being sad or anxious? Are there natural ways to correct the imbalances in our brain? And what are the endpoints with prescriptions? So I'll often see patients in my practice who have been on antidepressants for 20 or more years. I mean, the medication is just being continuously refilled. I mean, these are cases where we need to think about the endpoints. You know, can this patient be potentially weaned off the antidepressant um, by correcting some of the underlying imbalances? 
you know, it's really easy to start someone on, on medications for mood, but it's really hard to take them off. It's very challenging. So the good news is, you know, over the last few years, I've been able to take many patients off their antidepressants. And I do it through a very, very gradual step-by-step -step approach where we first try to correct their underlying imbalances, and then we take the dose down very, very gradually. So the good news is that with a doctor's supervision, antidepressants can be weaned off so that they are not used long term. The other thing to be aware of is that SSRIs will give your brain that impression that there's more serotonin floating around. But after a couple years of use, your net serotonin stores in your brain is actually depleted. So today I'm gonna to be talking about ways to naturally replenish the serotonin in your brain. So I wanted to give you a concrete case example. So let's say we have a patient named Mary who is a 47 year old woman who has a stressful job in finance. And she's noticing that her periods are now becoming more irregular. They're not necessarily every month. And she's struggling with lower mood. She's feeling depressed and anxious. She's only getting five to six hours of sleep per night, and those are not even good quality hours. And she's having to drink three or more cups of coffee to get through her day. She's so busy, she's just grabbing fast food, and she notices she has a sweet tooth, and she's getting migraines frequently. So Mary goes to her doctor, and this is a typical approach that some doctors may take. So Mary is given a prescription for Prozac for her depression. She's prescribed Imitrex, which is Sumatriptan, for her migraines. Now the thing is, three months later, she feels better, but she's still not really happy. She's also gained about 10 pounds, and she notices she has no libido. So she's not even sure if Prozac is really fixing the problem, and she can sense that something is off. So in my practice, I like to evaluate the whole patient and look for all possible causes of mood symptoms. So as this diagram shows, um, these are kind of the top main root causes of anxiety and depression that I'll see in my practice. So I like to search for, is there a vitamin deficiency? Is there a thyroid imbalance? Are there toxins the patient's being exposed to in the diet or the environment? Is there a problem with the gut microbiome? Because as I'm gonna talk about today, the gut-brain axis is very powerful in controlling mood. Is there a hormone imbalance? And this can be in both men and in women. You know, is the patient going through some significant stress or did they have a past trauma that is affecting them? Is there an issue with the blood sugars being um, imbalanced? And then is there a nature deficiency? And what I mean by that is nowadays a lot of us are stuck in an office in front of a screen or we're commuting. So we're not in contact with nature the way our ancestors used to. And so that can really affect the mood as well. So how would I evaluate Mary? So I always start with a thorough history, um, try to get to know the patient's diet, their stressors, their exercise, their support system. And then I typically will run comprehensive labs, you know, checking their hormones, their vitamins, their thyroid, and all their metabolic parameters. So these are Mary's root causes of her mood symptoms. Mary's going through perimenopause. So perimenopause is the years leading up to menopause, when a woman doesn't necessarily ovulate every month. So this can be accompanied by a big shift in hormone levels, and, and that can cause a lot of the mood symptoms. Mary also is deficient in B vitamins, vitamin D, magnesium, and omega-3 fatty acids. Because of her diet, her blood sugars are all over the place. They're unstable, and that's causing a lot of mood swings and migraines. The lack of exercise is just affecting her whole body. And then the excess caffeine is affecting her sleep. And that, then it's making her tired during the day, and so it's a vicious cycle of caffeine affecting the sleep. So how would I treat Mary? So I would start by cleaning up her diet to stabilize her blood sugars. So I always tell my patients, make sure you have protein, fat, and fiber at every meal. You never wanna just snack on a carb because if you just grab a croissant or a muffin, your blood sugar is gonna go up and then it's gonna crash down and that can trigger mood swings and migraines. The other thing I will tell Mary is to limit her caffeine to maximum of one cup in the morning and definitely no caffeine after noon because we don't want anything affecting her sleep. 
I'll encourage her to exercise. I mean, even 30 minutes of brisk walking because cardiovascular exercise naturally raises the dopamine levels in the brain, which is a happy brain neurotransmitter. I'll have her take a methyl B complex after breakfast every morning. And I'm gonna to talk today in, in detail about why B complex is so powerful for mood. I'll have her take a fish oil, omega-3, one gram. I'll give her vitamin D. I'll give her some magnesium at bedtime to really improve the quality of her sleep. And then I'll prescribe bioidentical progesterone to help regulate her cycles. So after three months, Mary will come back to see me and she will have lost 10 pounds. She's sleeping seven to eight hours and she feels refreshed upon awakening. See, she feels so much better eating a clean diet, no more migraines, and her periods are now regular with the bioidentical progesterone and her mood is improved and she is so much more productive at work. And this is all without any prescription antidepressant. So this is a good example showing how I like to address root causes of mood symptoms. So these are some of the key vitamins and nutrients that can really help with mood. So today I'm gonna to be talking about B vitamins, vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids, and magnesium. So B-complex vitamins are amazing for mood. And I like to think of them as the stress vitamin. And let's face it, we all have stress in our lives. So by B-complex, I mean all the Bs. B1, B2, B3, B6, B12. And the reason they're so powerful is B vitamins are the cofactors to boost up the serotonin and dopamine neurotransmitters in the brain. So they're gonna naturally boost up all these happy brain neurotransmitters. So it really, really helps with anxiety. It really boosts up the mood. The other nice thing is it helps with focus. So a lot of patients who are suffering from ADHD, or which is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it really, really helps them focus. The other nice thing is B vitamins help to lower sugar and carb cravings. So it helps patients to make better choices about what they're gonna eat throughout the day. The other nice thing is B vitamins are water soluble. So that means it's really hard to overdose. You can take pretty high doses. And typically I'll recommend patients to take the B vitamins in uh, about a thousandth percent daily value. So pretty high dose to change the brain neurochemistry. And the nice thing is all the extra Bs just go out in the urine. So if you're taking a high dose B, your urine will turn bright yellow. Don't be alarmed, that's normal. The other thing that I offer patients often is B12 shots. The reason we do this is a lot of people are having gut issues. They're bloated, they're not digesting, who knows how much they're getting out of a B complex supplement. So a lot of times when I see patients who are really struggling with anxiety or depression or their mood, they're just, they're just really having a hard time. We'll give them B12 shots in the office and that has become very popular and we're seeing extremely good results with that. A lot of patients come to my office just to get the B12 shot once a week, and we actually call it the happy shot. It really, really helps. So serotonin, the happy neurotransmitter in the brain, is actually made from the essential amino acid, tryptophan. You probably have heard of tryptophan. It's what's found in turkeys, yes. So B vitamins, the way they work is they are the cofactors for all the biochemical pathways that convert tryptophan to serotonin. So when you're taking a high dose B, B complex vitamin, you're boosting your serotonin production in the brain. This is another reason also why protein in the diet is so important. So a lot of patients who are just, you know, grazing on carbs all day, they won't have the protein or the tryptophan to make serotonin. So a lot of times, once we just get patients to eat more balanced meals, you know, with enough protein, that in itself improves their mood significantly. So this is showing how we make dopamine in the brain. Dopamine is another, another happy brain neurotransmitter and it's the reward neurotransmitter. So we make it from the amino acid tyrosine. And again, B vitamins are so powerful. They are the cofactors helping to make that conversion go smoothly. And then again, why amino acids in the diet from good protein is so important because they're the building blocks of all the brain neurotransmitters. So I wanted to introduce the methylation cycle. The methylation cycle is how your body processes B vitamins. And it ties into the methionine cycle, 
which leads to the production of glutathione, which is a master antioxidant in the body. The reason I bring this up is there's a very important gene called MTHFR, and it stands for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. And 50% of the population has one or more copies of this gene. Now, if you have this gene mutation, you're gonna have some problems processing regular B vitamins. And it also affects how your body methylates and detoxifies things in the body. And that can really affect mood. So MTHFR definitely has an important role in mood disorders. So patients who have a double copy of the MTHFR C677 gene are at higher risk of mood disorders and depression, bipolar disorder, they're also at higher risk of chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. So these patients are gonna have a harder time converting their tryptophan to serotonin and their tyrosine to dopamine. So they will not be able to really use regular B vitamins or folic acid. So these patients need the methylated form of the B vitamins to bypass this step. So in my practice, I often check patients for this gene, but I also like to assume that most people might have this gene and I just across the board recommend the methylated form of the B complex. So that's why I always say take a methyl B complex. So there are several genes actually that are very important and can influence your mood. In addition to the MTHFR, there's one called COMT, which stands for catecholamine O-methyltransferase. This is an important one because it, it's responsible for breaking down your anxiety brain neurochemicals, like your epinephrine and your norepinephrine. So it can influence anxiety, and it also controls how your body breaks down estrogens. So these are very helpful to know what your genetics are, and is that influencing your mood? So I have found that the best way to really test your genetics, if you're interested, is to do a 23andMe. So 23andMe is it's really easily accessible, and it's very affordable. And once you do that, you'll get a chance to download your raw genetic data, which is like 10,000 pages of DNA data. And then I send the patient an invitation to a company called Pure Genomics. So with Pure Genomics, the patient can upload their DNA data, and then it generates a very easy to understand report on all the key genes. And then based on this, I can help guide the patient on customized vitamins based on their genetic results. So if you're interested to learn more about gene uh, you know, your genes and how it can influence your mood, I highly recommend a book called Dirty Genes by Ben Lynch. It's a fascinating book. And what I like about it is it talks about what we can do with our lifestyle to change the expression of those genes. So now I wanna talk about omega-3 fatty acids. So these are essential fatty acids. And the reason is they are part of all the phospholipids in cell membranes. So in order to have healthy neurons firing in your brain, you need to have om enough omega-3 fatty acids. Most diets are really deficient in omega-3s. You know, unless you're eating wild salmon every day, you're probably deficient in omega-3s. A review article actually came out this year in Clinical Psychopharmacology and Neuroscience that summarized the importance of omega-3 fatty acids in the prevention of mood and anxiety disorders. So typically what I'll recommend is for mood symptoms, I'll recommend one to two grams of omega-3, which is EPA, DHA, from small fish. So I prefer like anchovy or krill because the smaller the fish, the less chance of contamination with mercury. I also recommend that your fish oil be third party tested and um, tested for mercury and also be pharmaceutical grade to ensure the quality. So for vegetarians, the best source of omega-3s is algae oil. So the reason is algae oil has the same EPA, DHA that's in fish oil, which is the active form of omega-3s. So it's superior to flax oil. Flax oil is alpha linolenic acid, which it's okay, but your body then has to convert it to EPA, DHA. The other downside to flax is it, it gets oxidized really quickly. So you never know about the quality of flax oil. 
And then in your diet, good sources of omega-3 are wild fish, grass-fed beef, and pasture-raised organic eggs. So magnesium is the calming mineral, and it really, really helps with anxiety. The reason magnesium helps with anxiety is it's the cofactor for the gene COMT. So it helps your body to break down those anxiety neurochemicals, the epinephrine and the norepinephrine. The other thing is people sleep amazing on magnesium, and that can make a huge difference. You know, magnesium is also important for all your liver detox pathways. Nowadays, most of our diets are deficient in magnesium, so it is helpful to take a magnesium supplement at bedtime. The other nice side effect of magnesium is it'll move your bowels. So the, the great thing is when people have good bowel movements, they feel so much better that their mood is already improving just from having that good bowel movement. The, the type of magnesium is very important. You want to avoid magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide is very harsh on the GI tract and it's poorly absorbed, so I always recommend avoid that. The types of magnesiums that I typically recommend are like magnesium glycinate, citrate, taurate, or other chelated forms, or even a combination of a variety of chelated forms to get the optimal absorption. Usually I'll also pair the magnesium with some calcium, and calcium and magnesium work amazing together to give you a deep restorative sleep and to help with muscle recovery at night. The exact dose really depends on the patient, depends on the bowel movements. Um, if someone's constipated, I'll give more magnesium. If someone is is fine, we'll pair it with the calcium. So it really, really depends. You know, over the years in practice, I've seen magnesium help with all kinds of symptoms, including PMS, migraine headaches, menstrual cramps, restless leg syndrome, palpitations, anxiety, muscle aches, insomnia, and even blood pressure issues. So it's pretty incredible. So this is a picture showing the foods where we can get magnesium in our diet. So magnesium is found in green leafy vegetables, nuts and seeds, beans, whole grains, and then my favorite, which is dark chocolate. Yeah. So vitamin D is incredibly important for mood. And what's funny is that most of us are deficient in vitamin D. When I test people's blood work, almost everybody is low, unless you're supplementing. So vitamin D is really a superstar vitamin. It's important for so many things. It's actually research proven to be cancer preventative for breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. Very important for metabolic health. Now they're saying it can help in prevention of diabetes and heart disease. Very important for your bone density because it controls the absorption of calcium from your diet. It's also important in hormonal health. So I like to get all my patients up to an optimal range of 60 to 80 you know, the normal range is like 30 to 100, but I really want to get it optimized because it's so important. So usually we'll give patients vitamin D, maybe 5,000 international units of D3, and D is always now paired with K2. K2 is an important vitamin that makes sure that all the calcium you're absorbing goes into your bones and not into your coronary arteries. Sometimes when I see patients who have really low vitamin D, I have to give them prescription vitamin D as well. Vitamin D2, 50,000 international units once a week for eight weeks. So we really want to get that up. It's that important. So foods that have vitamin D are egg yolks, salmon, grass-fed meats, butter, and dairy products. You also get vitamin D from the sunlight. So, but you have to be aware when you apply sunscreen, that's gonna limit the amount of vitamin D that you get from the sun. But regardless, sunlight is so good for mood, and that's why we're so blessed to live here in Southern California, where it's sunny almost every day of the year. You know, a lot of parts of the country, people suffer from seasonal affective disorder because of the overcast months during the winter. So what lab tests are important? So when I see a patient for the first time, I always like to order a very thorough lab panel. I like to cast a wide net, make sure we're not missing anything. So I always order a CBC, which is a complete blood count, and a comprehensive metabolic panel, looking at the liver enzymes, the electrolytes, the kidney function. I always order a full thyroid panel. 
So that's the, uh, the TSH, free T4, free T3, and I always order the TPO antibody, at least once. The TPO antibody stands for thyroid peroxidase antibody, and it's the antibody that causes autoimmune thyroid disease, or Hashimoto's thyroid disease. Hashimoto's is extremely common, and it can cause all kinds of symptoms because Hashimoto's, the antibody, crosses the blood-brain barrier and it can contribute to mood symptoms, anxiety, depression, brain fog. So I find that it's very important just to rule that out. So I also check, obviously, vitamin D levels. I check red blood cell magnesium to see how much magnesium is going into the cells. And then I check homocysteine. So homocysteine is what I like to determine a patient's B vitamin status. I find it more accurate and more helpful than checking B12 or folate. Because anyone taking a multivitamin, their B12 or folate levels are gonna look high. Homocysteine is kind of a cardiac inflammatory molecule and it's inversely proportional to your B vitamin needs. So homocysteine, if it's high, it's telling me you're really deficient in B vitamins. We need to give you more methyl B complex to get your homocysteine down. So ideal homocysteine is around six. So if your homocysteine is 10 or higher, then we definitely need to boost up the methyl B complex to bring it down. I also like to check a high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And that is a marker of inflammation in your body. I also check ferritin. Ferritin is your iron stores. And I've found over the years, there's so many women who just have low iron stores and that can contribute to anxiety and fatigue, so it's really important to know if you're deficient. Then I like to check fasting glucose and insulin, just to see what the metabolic parameters are. You know, is there any insulin resistance? Is there any tendency that we need to be worried about diabetes in the future? I like to check DHEA sulfate, which is the good adrenal hormone. It's very important for mental sharpness and for memory. I also like to check the hormones. The female hormones, you know, is estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone. If a woman is menstruating regularly, we will check these hormones on day 21 of the cycle. And the reason we do it on day 21 is because that's when progesterone peaks. Now, if a woman is having really irregular cycles, like they're going three months without a period or they're in menopause, we'll just check the, the labs any day, it doesn't matter. And then in men, I like to check testosterone, estradiol, and PSA, which is, PSA is the prostate cancer screening test. And then I often will order many additional tests depending on the patient and their history. You know, I may order food allergy tests, I may order celiac disease testing, or we may do testing on the gut microbiome to see if there's a, a problem there. So why is sleep so important? So, Sleep is kind of when your brain gets a chance to recharge. So just like every night when we charge up our cell phones, sleep is a chance for your brain to get to rest and take out the trash. So sleep is also very important for all the detoxification pathways in your body. So you need to have a good night's sleep for optimal mental sharpness and energy. And you know, people who don't sleep really well they're gonna have higher cortisol levels. Cortisol is the stress hormone, and cortisol has all the aging effects on the body. So getting that good night's sleep is really important to keep your cortisol down. There's a lot of research showing that people who have a healthy circadian rhythm, meaning they go to bed on time, and they wake up with the sunlight, they are overall in much better health. Um, they're at a healthier weight, they have better mood, and so much more. So if someone is struggling and they're not sleeping well or struggling with insomnia, that is definitely something that we have to address in order to correct their mood symptoms. So why is exercise so important? Well, when you exercise, especially cardiovascular exercise, you're naturally boosting up your dopamine levels in your brain, which is a happy neurotransmitter. The other thing is if you're exercising outside, the sunlight is so beneficial to your mood and also for vitamin D. Exercise is also great for hormonal health. So in men, exercise will naturally raise the testosterone levels. 
And in women, exercise really helps in reducing menstrual cramps and also helping to keep the cycles on schedule. You know, exercise also helps with your metabolic health. So your in, it helps to prevent insulin resistance. Insulin, is, insulin resistance is how your body processes sugars. So it's very important to prevention of diabetes. And then people who exercise get a really deep sleep at night. And then finally, exercise increases the blood circulation to the brain. So it's really important for a healthy brain. So does our gut affect our brain? So the gut has tremendous impact on our brain. We now know that there's something called the gut-brain axis. A significant portion of our brain neurotransmitters are actually made in the lining of our gut. So a lot of the serotonin and dopamine is actually made in our gut. That's why they now refer to the gut as the second brain. Anything affecting the gut is gonna affect the brain. For example, if I see a patient who's constipated or they're having a lot of food allergies or they're bloated, you know, their mood is going to suffer as well. You know, if they're eating an inflammatory diet, they're gonna experience inflammation in the gut and also inflammation in the brain. If they have irritable bowel syndrome or they have a gut infection with a parasite or an overgrowth of a bad bacteria, they're not gonna feel well and they may get anxiety or depression. Often when we correct the gut issues, their mood symptoms improve as well. So there was a review article that was published in 2018 in Neuropsychobiology, and, it, and if you're interested, there's a link to the full article on my website. But this was a very nice article, and it talked about how important nutrition and the gut microbiome are for healthy mood. And it definitely acknowledges the role of the gut-brain axis. So Hippocrates actually once said, all disease begins in the gut. And I think that's very true. You're only as healthy as your gut. So the message here is don't ignore gut issues. You know, healthy gut, healthy mind. So in my practice, I actually specialize in digestive disorders as well. So in fact, two weeks from today on October 22nd, I'm gonna be giving another talk here on the gut microbiome and how it impacts your overall health. I'll be talking about irritable bowel syndrome, SIBO, which is small intestine bacterial overgrowth, leaky gut, food allergies, sensitivities, and much more. So please join me if you can. So how do hormones affect mood? So moods can definitely fluctuate with the menstrual cycle, and I'm gonna go over this in detail today. Perimenopause, which is the years leading up to menopause, and menopause, which is when women stop having periods and they stop ovulating, this can be associated with lower mood and definitely more anxiety. Actually, women can have pretty significant symptoms. They can have palpitations, they can have insomnia. And sometimes it's so severe, a lot of women end up on antidepressants, sleep medication, anxiety pills when they're transitioning to menopause. But really the root cause is a hormone imbalance. So in my practice, my preference is to treat patients with bioidentical hormone replacement. So bioidentical hormones are hormones that have the same chemical structure as hormones in the human body. And if they're made in a compounding pharmacy, they're typically made from plant sources like yams. And so we find that by balancing the hormones, we can really improve mood and help women um, have a good quality of life and transition gracefully to menopause. Both women and men who have low testosterone can suffer from low mood, so we replace the testosterone as well if we need to, in very low doses. And in men, if they have low testosterone, I always wanna first find out why they have low testosterone. Is there a zinc deficiency, or is there another imbalance that we need to find out? But in many cases, when we replace with just a low dose of bioidentical testosterone, which is just topical, like a gel or cream, we see significant improvement in their mood. So getting your hormones balanced is very, very important for mood. Then the thyroid is very, very important. I'm gonna talk about today. But if your thyroid is off, if it's high or low, that can affect your mood. And then having high cortisol from chronic stress can definitely negatively impact mood. So let's delve into the menstrual cycle in more detail. So women are very sophisticated beings when it comes to hormones. So the menstrual cycle is hormones that cycle up and down. 
So estrogen will peak in the first half of the month and progesterone will peak in the second half of the month. Ovulation takes, right in the, takes place right in the middle of the month, day 14. Now the issue is at the last week of the month, progesterone naturally goes down and progesterone is the calming hormone. So when progesterone goes down, that's when women get really anxious. They get PMS, they get breast tenderness, migraines, a lot of symptoms. And at the very end of the cycle, um, there's also a rise in the insulin levels, which leads to sugar cravings, which is why a lot of women crave sweets right before their periods. So women who are not having regular menstrual cycles or they're not ovulating regularly, they won't even be making the progesterone in the second half of the month. So you only make this progesterone in the second half of the month if you ovulate. So if you don't ovulate, you don't make the progesterone. And this can cause a lot of anxiety and mood symptoms. Also, women in perimenopause, again, because they're not ovulating regularly, they're gonna have a lot more symptoms, anxiety, panic attacks, palpitations, poor sleep, and this can really affect their quality of life. So what I like to do in my practice is balance the hormones by giving some bioidentical progesterone. And we'll typically just give it the second half of the month, so from like day 13 through 27, and it can be a capsule, it can be topical, it just really depends on the patient. And by balancing those hormones, patients feel their mood is so much more stable. They can get through their, their life much better, they're not anxious, they're not having crazy mood swings at the end of the month. So what about birth control pills? So birth control pills, you know, um, what the, the way it works is it shuts down the whole menstrual cycle. So it actually prevents your brain from talking to your ovaries because you have the synthetic hormones there that prevent ovulation from taking place. Now the issue is that a lot of women are put on birth control pills, not really for contraception, but just because they're having period problems. So they're having heavy periods or irregular periods or cramps. So what I like to do in my practice is figure out what is the root cause of those symptoms. And if needed, you know, we'll give a little bit of bioidentical progesterone. The nice thing with that is it just adds to what your body is making. It doesn't suppress everything. And for mood, it seems to be a lot better. Now, a big study just came out in JAMA Psychiatry, actually just this past Friday, and it looked at 1,000 teenage girls who were on birth control pills. And it found that 16-year-old girls who are taking birth control have a higher incidence of depression. So this is just something to be aware of. You know, a lot of medications have side effects. So if we can figure out what the root causes of these menstrual problems are or treat it with some bioidentical progesterone, we can prevent a lot of like the mood side effects of birth control. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the thyroid. So the thyroid is the butterfly-shaped organ in your neck. And it's probably the most important endocrine gland in, in your body. I like to think of it as the thermostat for your mood, your metabolism, your weight, your temperature, and your fertility. So the thyroid works through a feedback loop with the brain. So your brain actually makes TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. <coughs> and that tells your thyroid to make T4. Now, T4 is not the active form though. Your body then has to convert the T4 to T3. Now, T3 is the active form of thyroid hormone and is very, very important for mood. Now, if you're really stressed out, you're gonna convert your T4 to reverse T3. And reverse T3 is inactive in the body. It doesn't do, any, do you any good. Now, in order to make T4, you need to have iodine. It's an essential trace mineral to make T4. And then in order to convert your T4 to T3, you need selenium. So sometimes I'll, I'll test patients for deficiencies in iodine. And if we find that there's a deficiency, then we can give them a little bit of iodine replacement and that can really help the thyroid function. If I find a low T3, then sometimes I'll give them selenium, 200 micrograms a day, to help that conversion. And in other times, I do prescribe T3, which is called Cytomel, in low doses, and that can have a significant impact on mood. So the, the impact of T3 on mood is actually accepted in the medical literature, and a lot of cases of refractory depression will respond to T3 replacement. 
The other thing I specialize in my practice is the management of Hashimoto's thyroid disease. So Hashimoto's is autoimmune thyroid disease where you have an antibody, the thyroid peroxidase antibody or the TPO antibody that's attacking your thyroid gland. The reason this is an issue is because if you leave it that way, the thought is that your thyroid is gonna struggle in the future and you're gonna have to use higher and higher doses of thyroid replacement. So what I like to do with my patients is I follow a protocol where we, it's through diet and supplements and we see significant improvement in reducing that TPO antibody. And remember the TPO antibody can cross that blood brain barrier. So when it's high, it can affect the mood, it causes anxiety, brain fog, all kinds of symptoms. So getting it down can really impact the patient's quality of life. So how does sugar and bad carbs affect mood? So let's say you're low in energy, you're low in mood, and you grab a brownie or a cookie. What's gonna happen is you're gonna get a rush of dopamine. You're gonna feel pretty happy for a little bit. But then about an hour or two later, the dopamine's gonna crash. And if you remember, dopamine is the reward neurotransmitter. So anything that is causing dopamine to go up and down is gonna lead to addiction. You're gonna keep wanting something that creates that in your brain. So that is why sugar is more addicting than cocaine. Studies on rats have proven this. They've put rats and they've given them cocaine water and sugar water. And the rats will always choose the sugar water over the cocaine water. So I always tell my patients to try to limit the refined sugar in their diet. And it really helps in preventing mood swings as well. It's better to pick a snack that's more stable for your blood sugars, maybe like apples and almond butter or nuts, something like that. Um, the interesting thing with sugar cravings is they're really all or nothing. So if you dabble in sugar, you're gonna want more sugar. If you cut it out completely, you're not gonna miss it anymore. So how does insulin spikes affect mood? So once again, let's say you're really hungry and you just grab the quick brownie or donut. And what that's gonna cause is a spike in insulin. Insulin is the hormone that your pancreas makes, telling your body to take up blood sugar. The problem is insulin is inflammatory, both on the body and the brain. So initially when the insulin spikes up, you're also gonna get a release of serotonin. You're gonna feel pretty happy for a little bit. But then an hour or two later, your blood sugar is gonna crash. And that is gonna cause the serotonin to be depleted. The other thing is when blood sugar crashes, people can get all kinds of symptoms. They can get anxiety, panic attacks, shaky, irritable. It can be pretty scary and pretty profound. So that's why when we cut out the sugar completely, mood stabilizes. So in my practice, I typically tell my patients, try to limit your refined sugar intake to under five grams per day. So that's the amount of sugar in a teaspoon. So the good news is that with the help of the B-complex vitamins, this is possible. This, the B-complex really helps to lower your sugar cravings. So how does caffeine affect mood? So it's interesting, and sometimes I'll see patients who are so anxious, but then when I ask them, how much coffee are you drinking? They're like, four or five cups a day. So, you know, caffeine can really heighten your anxiety. And caffeine is also really dehydrating on the body. The other thing is a lot of people just ignore their, their fatigue. You know, if they're tired, they just reach for more coffee. But the problem is, you know, when your body's tired, sometimes you gotta listen to what your body's telling you and you gotta rest. If you just keep drinking coffee and pushing through it, that can lead to more serious problems down the line. It's like using a credit card for energy. Down the line, it can lead to adrenal fatigue and more serious forms of fatigue. So for any kind of anxiety or mood issues, I typically have my patients limit their caffeine to only one cup in the morning maximum and nothing after noon. And in, in certain cases, we have to cut out the complete ca uh, caffeine completely. So how does alcohol affect mood? So alcohol is a depressant. And you know the other thing is it puts an extra burden on your liver to detoxify things. So it can also affect your hormone levels. So we'll typically see that women who drink wine regularly, they'll have higher estrogen levels on the blood, on the blood work. So when the liver is focusing on detoxifying alcohol, it won't be able to detoxify estrogen quite as well. And we actually see this in men as well. 
uh, I do see a lot of men who have high estradiol levels on the blood work. And it's typically, you know, men who are, are drinking beer regularly. The alcohol does influence the breakdown of the estrogens. The other thing is alcohol turns into sugar. So then it feeds all the bad bacteria in your gut. So it'll change your microbiome. And remember, your gut is your second brain. So anything that has a bad effect on your microbiome is not good for your mood. And lastly, alcohol can affect your sleep. You know, um, a lot of times I'll hear women tell me, or men as well, if they're having a couple drinks with dinner that, you know, in the middle of the night they wake up at two or three in the morning because their blood sugar just crashed. So it can affect sleep. So what other toxins can affect mood? So sometimes with my patients, we have to dig a little bit deeper. Depending on their exposures or their occupation, you know, we have to test for other things. So sometimes we'll test for heavy metals. You know, is there exposure to mercury, arsenic, lead, cadmium? And if we find these things, then I help them with a gentle detox protocol to get those things out of the body. Sometimes there's infections, like maybe there's a parasite in the gut or H. pylori or a bacterial imbalance, and that is creating some of the mood symptoms. You know, if a patient is living in a home that has water damage or mold, that can definitely affect their whole body and their mood. And then pesticides can really affect mood. Um, some patients are really sensitive to pesticides, so we see such a dramatic improvement in their mood and their overall health when they switch to eating more organic. And then finally, drugs can affect your mood. Even if you're smoking marijuana every day, that can affect your mood. So what type of diet is ideal for mood? So there is no single diet that's really ideal for everyone. It really has to be customized based on the patient, their food allergies, and their diagnoses. But there are some basic uh, you know, principles that I recommend across the board. So I always recommend a whole foods diet. So you want to avoid all the processed food because all those processed chemicals can really affect your mood. So you want to eat food in their natural form. If there's a label on it and it has a long list, you shouldn't be eating it. Then aim for five colors a day. You want a lot of colorful fruits and vegetables. So you want like your, your berries, your green vegetables, your carrots, your purple cabbage, because that's going to give you that big spectrum of antioxidants that you need. You know, try to eat as organic as much as possible. You know, if you're on a budget, I recommend look up the dirty dozen list, which is really easy to find, and at least buy those items organic because those are the highest in pesticides. Good fats are very important. You know, good fat is so important for the brain, for your hormones, and good fat keeps you full. So by good fat, I mean like avocados, olive oil, nuts, and then I recommend clean, organic, or wild proteins. So that's like pasture-raised eggs, organic chicken, organic turkey, grass-fed beef, wild salmon. If you're a vegetarian, then I recommend you know nuts, seeds, beans, lentils. Once again, I recommend the protein, fat, fiber at every meal to keep your blood sugar stable. That is very, very important. And then lastly, it really depends on your condition. And so that's something I specialize in my practice is helping patients navigate their diet based on their diagnoses. So for example, if you have prediabetes, I have a certain diet that I will recommend and I give the patient handouts. If they have Hashimoto's, I have a diet for that. If you have autoimmune disease, there's a different diet for that. So it really depends on your condition. So this is a food pyramid that I drew, and um, I put vegetables at the bottom because vegetables are the most important part of your diet. They are the key to reversing most chronic diseases. You know, they're very anti-inflammatory. They give your gut microbiome all the good fiber that it needs. And remember, all disease begins in the gut. So sometimes I tell patients, aim for one pound of vegetables per day. It sounds like a lot, but it's doable. And if you do that, you'll feel incredibly good, I assure you. I also recommend good fat and protein at every meal. So what do you wanna keep out of your diet? So you definitely wanna keep out the refined sugar. Again, because that'll put you on an emotional roller coaster. You wanna really cut out the processed food because you don't want those chemicals. 
trans fat and vegetable oils are very inflammatory, both on the body and the brain. And then you want to avoid preservatives and MSG. As I mentioned, MSG will bind to the glutamate receptors in the brain. Avoid food colorings, for sure. I mean, in children, those artificial colors can create hyperactivity and really change their mood. And actually in adults as well. Alcohol, like we talked about, you know, you can enjoy in moderation, but just be aware of, you know, all those things that it can cause in your body. Caffeine, again, you want to limit it, maybe just one cup per day. And then avoid the highly refined carbohydrates. So that's the pastries, the donuts, the brownies. So this is a picture of a healthy, clean dinner, and it's actually a picture I posted on Instagram. So if you're interested, follow me on Instagram. I like to share what I'm eating with my patients. But this is wild salmon with mango salsa and arugula salad. So clean whole foods can be yummy and tasty too. And this is an example of a breakfast that I'll have. This is a pasture-raised egg, cherry tomatoes, avocado, and organic blueberries. So this kind of food really gives you that sustained energy and you feel really good all morning long. So is gluten a problem for the brain? So gluten sensitivity is definitely on the rise. And part of the reason is a lot of wheat products are genetically modified and hence they're inflammatory. Gluten actually turns into something called gluteomorphins, which has an opioid-like effect on the brain, which is why bread is so addicting. So after people eliminate gluten, a lot of gut issues go away. So let's say a patient's sensitive to gluten, they're having all this bloating and tummy problems. When they cut it out, a lot of their digestive problems go away. And because the gut is the second brain, their mood symptoms improve as well. So that's why sometimes cutting out gluten, we can see such an improvement in patient's mood. So what else helps with mood? So there's actually so many other things you can try for mood. Um, you know, being exposed to sunlight, going outdoors, being in nature, going to the beach, that can help tremendously with mood. You know, finding a type of exercise you enjoy, whether it's yoga, Zumba, dance, Pilates, hiking, all of that is so good for mood. Meditation is very powerful for mood. Going to therapy or counseling is so good as well. You know, a lot of women, they just feel so much better when they talk about their feelings. To be honest, when women talk sometimes, they get natural dopamine release in the brain. That's why a lot of women need to talk about their feelings. Um, and then gratitude journaling is really helpful because it helps you get a positive outlook on things. You know, prayer can be very powerful. Acupuncture, massage, you know, having a good network of friends, family, community, that's really important. You know, if you have a significant other and you know, emotional and physical intimacy is also good for mood. Pets are very nice for mood and you know, partially because they're great companions, they're loving. And a lot of mood issues sometimes stem from being lonely. For anxiety, you know, taking a hot bath with Epsom salts can be so relaxing. And the reason is Epsom salts are so high in magnesium. So remember how magnesium is the calming mineral. It goes right into your body and helps you feel more relaxed. And then essential oils can actually change your mood through aromatherapy. So the smells can actually influence your mood. For example, lavender essential oil, if you put it in a diffuser and breathe it in, is so good. It helps you sleep better. It helps alleviate anxiety. Peppermint oil and citrus oil are uplifting and boosting to the mood. So sometimes in my practice, I actually do prescribe meditation instead of medication. And meditation can actually change the brain, your focus, your ability to handle stress, and your mood. There's actually numerous publications on PubMed showing the powerful effects of meditation on mood, heart health, blood pressure, and so much more. So what other supplements can you try for your mood? So there are other supplements, and sometimes I do use these as well, but one thing I recommend is that you don't mix these with your prescription antidepressants. It's best to do these with a doctor's supervision. So just like we talked about, tryptophan is the precursor to serotonin. The immediate precursor to serotonin is actually called 5-HTP. 
So sometimes we'll give that to a patient to boost up their serotonin level, levels in their brain. GABA, we can use that in supplement form and that's calming, helps with anxiety. Uh, tyrosine is the precursor again to dopamine, so we could use that to boost up dopamine. L-theanine is so good for anxiety. SAM-E has been used for a very long time, very helpful for mood symptoms as well, for depression. And then choline helps to boost up acetylcholine levels in the brain, and that's used sometimes for memory issues. And then there are a lot of herbal supplements and teas that we can use for anxiety. So for example, you know, teas or supplements with chamomile or valerian can really be helpful and help with anxiety. So this is how I like to evaluate patients in my practice. So I practice integrative medicine, so I look at the whole person. And my goal is always to look for root causes of symptoms. So we'll typically address each of these areas and phases. So we'll first start by cleaning up the diet. Then we'll work on nutritional deficiencies. We'll work on balancing the hormones, figuring out is there a gut microbiome or digestive imbalance? Do we need to do testing for sensitivities or food allergies? Should we look at your genetic data to see how we can customize recommendations based on your genetics? We'll discuss you know, mental, emotional, spiritual factors that are affecting your health. We'll talk about toxins, you know, should we test for toxins based on your occupation or your exposures? And then we'll look for infections, you know, it could be a parasite, a, um, a yeast infection, or a virus, something that's affecting your overall health. So the nice thing is once we kind of correct all of these factors, we do see people, you know, patients' health improve significantly. So if you're interested to learn more, please visit my website. Um, it's oc-integrative-medicine.com. Please follow me on Facebook and Instagram because I put a lot of health updates and I like to share a lot of kind of the healthy foods I like to eat with my patients as well. You can find the links to these um, from my website. If you're interested to make an appointment, please give my office a call. I do accept four major PPOs. And thank you to St. Jude today for giving me the opportunity to speak. And thank you to all my friends and to my patients for coming out this evening. It was great to see you all.